Now that you've found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com. It's time for the Bonnie Cher Show, a whirlwind of wit, wisdom, celebrity, and the boomer life. With a little bit of this, and a lot of that, and so much more you don't want to miss, here's Bonnie! Hello! (laughs) And I just ended the show before I started it. Hi, everybody. I'm Bonnie Cher, and I'd like to thank you for joining me today. I am your host and your guide through the world of celebrity, the boomer generation, and type 1 diabetes. My thanks to Wayne Cobbin for that super duper theme music. Thank you, Wayne. Today's guests, both of whom will be in studio with me, are Emmy-nominated actress, dancer, and phenomenal sculptress, Suzanne Charney. And for my Type 1 guest, we have Brad of the Diabetes Heroes Squad. We're going to be discussing topics from technical advances to reports of closing in on a cure for type 1. If you have a question or a comment, please follow us on the hashtag BShareRadio. That's hashtag B-S-H-E-R radio. So now, if you would, please say hello to my friend and my guest, Suzanne Charney. Hey! Yeah! <laughs> Hello, Suzanne. Hi, Bonnie, my love. How are you? I'm good, girlfriend. I'm so glad to see you here, Suzanne. You are such an enigma and a fascinoma to me. There's, it seems to me that there's virtually nothing that you don't do. Cook. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But you can order, so it's just as good. I know where you came from. Um, What would you say in all of your crazy moments, which we're pretty sure there have been quite a few, what was the craziest moment you ever had on stage? Oh, my God. The craziest moment. Oh, oh, I just remembered. I was doing Sweet Charity on Broadway with Gwen Verdon. Mm -hmm. My back went out just before the number, the rich man's frug. She gave me a pill to take, and it had a reaction. I don't know what I did, but people were pushing me around to get in the right place. (laughs) So that was the craziest (laughs) moment I ever had. (laughs) Did she know what she was doing? No, she didn't. (laughs) Me, I take an Excedrin and I'm high, you know. (laughs) Tell me, I know that you started out at the professional school in New York, right? Performing Arts High School, right. And so what got you out of the classroom and the academics. the stage? Not the, <laughs> dance, not the dance classes. I cut school for the academics. Um, I was going to Performing Arts High School in the dance department, the movie Fame, for those who don't know. Um, that, that was Performing Arts High School. And I auditioned for West Side Story for Jerry Robbins. In my audition... I made it, and he said to me, uh, welcome to Australia. And I said, I'm 15 years old. I cut school. So cut to the chase. I told my parents I cut school. That was the first thing. And the second thing was to have Jerry Robbins call my parents and get permission. So it was a long night, and I heard them talking in the kitchen. I wasn't a great student, to say the least, in my academia. Um, and I, when I woke up at 5 o'clock to get ready from Brooklyn to go into Manhattan to go to high school, my father said, well, welcome to Australia. And that was my first gig. 
working doing West Side in Australia at 15. Wow. Mm -hmm. I have goosebumps from that story. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> so then some other really wonderful things came your way. Can you tell me a little bit about the process of auditioning for Bob Fosse? These are good questions. Jeez. Okay. Um, I auditioned. And uh, at the audition, when you had a call back, he said, I want people to come with a song of, and I thought he said a very demure song. It was far from demure. Everyone got dressed up with little vampy clothes. You had to sing and dance in the show. And I sang, I wore a pink pleated skirt and a pink little top, and I sang, um, I'm just a girl who can't sing <laughs> no. It was so wrong. It was so wrong. But Gwen Verdon had me sing the entire song. She was in the uh, in the uh, auditioning thing in the audience because that was her auditioning song many years ago. So she wanted to hear the whole thing through. Did you know that? No, no. And I got the job. Oh, they wanted you to play an instrument too. Oh, so I, I was working wait. at the World's Fair uh -huh. and at the uh, Hollywood Pavilion. And what I did was I went and I took drum lessons at the African Pavilion. And I could play a quinto, boom, ba -ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -ba. that was it. That was all I could play. That's all you needed. So I went with the quinto, and a girl before me auditioning, and they said to me, put a little uh, a book there so you get more residents from the sound, whatever, it sounds better. I asked for the little book, and I started doing my one, boom, ba -ba -bum. she got up there, put bang bongo drums between her legs, and played the shit out of it. <laughs> oh my God, I thought, this is it. I blew this gig. And I got it. I couldn't believe it. I got the show. It's because you didn't put anything between your legs. Is That's right. That <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Let me ask you this. Yeah. <laughs> if, I mean, we know you as a dancer. Mm -hmm. We know you as an actress. Actor, I'm sorry. Um, if you... If you had the opportunity to master one more skill, what would you want it to be? Neuroscientist. A neuroscientist. And why? I like reading the articles in my Zeit. I'm into neuroscience now. <laughs> and there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. If she's not dancing, she'll be very neuroscientific. <laughs> Um, I do want to take a minute with you, Suzanne, and talk about your sculpture. Um, you knocked me out as a dancer. You've knocked me out as a performer. You've certainly knocked me out as a friend. And boy, oh boy, when I started to see the work that you're doing, it just floored me. Can you Thank please you. show our audience a representation of one of your pieces and tell us about it? Just so happens, this was in my purse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is the smallest piece. Oh, a little to the right. This is the small piece. I couldn't lift the big ones. Um, I do a lot of dancers. This is Martha Graham. Um, it comes in a series of three with Common de Lavalade. Anyway, this comes in resin or bronze uh, marble base or you could have a wooden base i have a website you could check out my website can i plug would my you website? please tell us what your website is just so happens i know it by heart charney sculptures that's c-h-a-r-n is in nancy y s-c-u-l-p-t-u-r-e-s -E at uh what is it no now it's at, dot com oh dot com i'm sorry see <laughs> you know it's a dot com it's a www dot charney sculptures dot com <laughs> i feel like we're doing the commercial for what is the what is the ampersand sign what is the internet <laughs> and the funny thing is is she's one of my biggest techie friends i, I get know. calls from her oh and the other thing is can i plug one more thing uh, please plug away okay um i study sculpting and i couldn't have learned as fast and as good without acknowledging George, who teaches at Teal Street Studio in Culver City. So if anybody wants to learn sculpting, Teal Street Studio lets you be yourself, explore, and it opened up a new life for me. Well, I'll be leaving kind of for the studio as soon as I leave the <laughs> studio. Suzanne, you're wonderful to come in and spend this time for me. And uh, before we go to break, 
it's just been a pleasure to have you here with me today. I want you to come back. I want to get many, many more stories. I want to see lots and lots and lots more sculpture. And maybe someday you'll let me buy a piece. And I'm proud of you. I love you. I love you, too. Thank you for being here with me, Suzanne. You are listening to The Bonnie Cher Show. And a few more minutes, we are going to come back and we're going to chat a little more with Suzanne and see what else of the wonderful stories we can get to come out from her. Because I went a little too fast, ladies and gentlemen, and I have more time. So, Suzanne. Bonnie. <laughs> so good to see you <laughs> here. You. I'll get this show down right. Okay, um, let's go to my next question. What is the greatest piece of advice that you ever received and who gave it to you? Martha Graham. And what did Martha say? If you ever make a mistake, make it big so everyone else looks wrong. <laughs> love it. I love it. All right, well, that was a quicker answer than I was anticipating. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let me ask you this. What do you think I mean, you've definitely had what is seemingly a charmed life. But nobody goes through life untouched altogether. At least that's my opinion. Um, what do you think was your most challenging obstacle, Suzanne? And what did you use and what did you do to overcome it? Do you have another question? <laughs> Apparently the obstacle is answering this question. Um, the biggest obstacle I've had was in my career mm -hmm. or in your life I'll go for both I never really had obstacles um, the, the biggest thing I had in my career as an obstacle I guess was singing and I had to kind of learn to make the best with whatever vocal ability I had did it ever stop you from working did you think it was that much of an obstacle Enough that I was scared to death every time I had to audition with a song or sing on a Johnny Carson show. I would sweat a lot. Can you tell us about your appearances on the Johnny Carson show? I know he loved you. I know. And, and it's a miracle because he told me I reminded him of one of his ex-wives. <laughs> Better than an ex-husband. It was a great experience. <laughs> it was a great experience doing the panel, sitting down. That's how I got to go to Vietnam. Bob Hope saw me on the show. And that helped my career a lot, a lot. He was very good that way, wasn't yeah. he? If he liked you, he did everything he could for yeah. you. All right. Um, would you ever consider doing choreography, using your dance education at this point? Have you done choreography for others? Will you consider it if somebody called you and said, help me build an act? Could you help them? Probably, but I'd have someone demonstrate the dance steps now. <laughs> So you mean we're not opening a dance school, you and I? Oh, no, forget about it. <laughs> uh, I'm okay. lucky I'm walking. <laughs> I'm so titanium, please. <laughs> you can't go through an airport with her, but other than that, she's a lot of laughs. <laughs> um, speaking of laughing, the way Suzanne and I met was, oh my gosh, this was in the late 80s. I think it was 89, yeah. maybe 88, 89 when I was invited to tag along with Sammy and Altavis Davis to the Professional Dancers Society luncheon, and they that year they were paying homage to Sammy. And there was this wacky redhead sitting next to me who I didn't know, but by the time I left lunch, I think she became my best friend, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is how I met Suzanne I was a redhead Charney. then? You're a redhead now, no? No, it's oxidized. <laughs> Same story. <laughs> Different hair day. Um, did you did you work on stage with Sammy? Yes, yeah, Sammy and I did a Sweet Charity, the movie together. That and I, I did, know. I yeah. did a Johnny Carson show with Sammy. Now that I didn't know. Yeah, and it's, uh, I don't know if it's one of, someone told me it was one of the best of Carson's or something, where um, I did my song and dance number, sat on the panel, Sammy was already there, and I was so thirsty and I needed a drink of water and Sammy held his hands out 
and Johnny Carson poured water in his hands, and I started drinking out of his hands. And Sammy said, that's the first time you've seen a white girl drink out of a black man's hands. <laughs> <laughs> And Sammy and I are very, very close because Altavis, his wife, and I went to high school together. So. That's right, you did. Were you yeah. in the same class as performing, all time? That's right, performing arts high school. Who else was in that class? Anybody else I might know? I don't know. I don't think so. Just Altavis and me and my best friend Mikey. Um, somebody has tweeted in a question, and it re- this is uh, j- at Jarby Blackman on Twitter, and she writes, ask Suzanne about her recent visit, it does say that, with llamas? I want a llama ranch. You want one, or you want? A llama ranch, I want one. I think I'm going to see if I could purchase, and then every time I go to visit my daughter in Minnesota, there's a llama ranch there. Oh, I see. And you're I you're planning on keeping this llama well, yeah. place in, in there. Not, you're not going to do it in your condo here. And, no, I don't no. think the homeowners would appreciate <laughs> no, it. So. They are the sweetest animals. They kiss you. Their hair is... But what about but, when they... Bleh, no, they just spit a little. <laughs> At least they don't smoke cigars. <laughs> So that's, I love No, them. actually, I, I, I do know that you've just come back from a safari also. Yes, I was in Tanzania. So, and you can Jumbo. Pro- <laughs> Jumbo. Hello. I love, I, oh, I love Africa. I love the animals. I sculpted a few pieces since I came back Did from Africa. Did you have yeah. seen those? Yeah. So tell us again, where can we see your sculpting? On, on the internet, you could go to, oh, should I plug it again? One more time. Why not? Okay. Charney, www.charneysculptures, C-H-A-R-N-Y-S-C-U-L-P-T-U-R-E-S dot com. See, I knew she'd get it this time. By George, I got it. Take two. <laughs> <laughs> well, Suzanne, that's about it for us today. But no, it's really not because I seem to have even more time. See how time flies when we're here. I talk fun. fast, that's why. You do. You do. I've had other guests. <laughs> really? Probably. Bad out. Um, so what's next? What do you want to work on next? Do you, I mean, do you have a new sculpture in mind, a new project? I've got a few I'm working on now. Yeah. One is a girl walking a, an Afghan dog, and I use wood as well in my pieces. I like mixed medium. So I'll have trees cut out and wood and stuff like Sunday in the Park with George. That would be great. I see the size here, but tell me, what is the largest piece you've done so Oh, my far? God. About two feet tall, two and a half feet tall. I did Zoot Suit. Ah, oh, love Zitsu. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure that you go to her website and take a look. Her work is phenomenal. Everything And I have a her. lamp. If you want a lamp, there's a beautiful lamp I did. And it's not a llama lamp. No, it's not a, a llama, llama lamp. lamp. It's <laughs> okay. not a llama lamp. It's a dancer's lamp. <laughs> I would like that, too. I could just decorate in Charney. That could be my new home. And I think you would all love to have a piece of Suzanne's work gracing your home also. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank my friend Suzanne Charney. I want to thank you. And we are going to take a break for a minute. And right now you are listening to The Bonnie Shear Show. Join the conversation. You can follow us on Twitter at hashtag B-S-H-E-R radio. Coming up, Inside My Blue World, plus a shout out from my soapbox my take on who got it right and who got it terribly wrong now before we go to break i'd like to play for you one of my favorite tunes that sums up just about how i'm feeling right now by the wonderful miss lena horn and it's the song if you believe take it away if we know ourselves we're always home, anywhere. If you believe within your heart, you'll know that no one can change. 
path that you must go. Believe what you feel and know you're right because the time will come around when you'll say it's yours. Believe that you can go home. Believe you can float on air. Yes, click your heels three times. If you believe Welcome back to the Bonnie Shear Show. Joining me in this segment is my friend Brad of the Diabetes Heroes Squad. Oh, please, 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 please stop, please, don't. Never, never tell them to stop. <laughs> um, Brad is a member of the Type 1 Diabetes community, and welcome to the show, Brad. You're living with T1. Tell us your story. The last time I checked, I was living with T1. <laughs> what is my story? Um, I prefer the term juvenile diabetes. It's a bit outdated, but it makes me feel younger. You Doesn't know what I mean? Uh, yes, Call I yourself do. a juvenile diabetic. That would work. I'm a juvenile diabetic. See, you're I, right. You're it feels so much better. Yeah. Um, I got mine late. I was um, When I was growing up, I was always very, very heavy. I weighed at uh, 1.320 pounds. My I know. goodness. Yeah, that's right. My goodness. Uh, but then I moved out to California, and you can't live in California if you look like a cow. <laughs> so I decided to lose some weight. I lost a lot of weight, and I was actually very th this thin for about three years. And then um, I, I thought I had the flu. I went to the doctor. He says, you have type 1 diabetes. I said, I haven't eaten sugar because I, I cleaned everything up. I didn't eat sugar. I didn't eat meat. Yeah, I still drank. Um, but I said, you know, I don't eat sugar. He says, that's nothing to do with it, as we now know. Most mm -hmm. people believe that if you have diabetes, you got it because of sugar. No, you didn't. You got it because you're cursed. <laughs> no, but I, uh, so it was, I didn't really have to change my dietary needs. And being type 1, you don't have to anyway. You can eat the same things everybody else eats. See, people don't understand no, that. They don't. It's like everybody wags their finger if they see me take a piece of chocolate. I can have the chocolate. I can take insulin. It's none of your business. Thank you very much. And if you're saying phrases like, should you be eating that? <laughs> Stop doing that, would you? Really, it is the most annoying should thing. Should you be saying that? <laughs> no, but yes. Yes. Um, well, you brought up already a, a point um, which directs me to ask the question, what do you think your greatest challenges are on a day-to-day -day basis, on a weekly basis, just in general, what are, what are your biggest challenges? Finding parking in Los Angeles. <laughs> That's what's my biggest challenge. No, you know, and I say that as a joke, but with people with diabetes, I always go like, you know, it, I'm not a victim. I'm not, it's, it's a survivable disease. It's a daily disease. You got to think about 24 seven, whether unconsciously or consciously. 
But it doesn't stop anybody from, from living. There are, there are worse problems. The challenge of keeping your blood sugar regulated, that's, you know, no harder than keeping my show business career regulated. You know well, what I mean? It's just that easy. As a matter of fact, diabetes helps it because at least you can control that. I can't control the other stuff in this town, that's for sure. Let me ask. Well, okay. I, I will agree with you up to a point. Um, and that point is then the C word. <laughs> You're talking to a stand-up comedian. Don't ever say the C word because I'm my mind goes, yeah, yeah. I know where what your is, mind went. What is the C word? Complications. Oh, complications. Yes, that is. that can be. Um, a di- people with diabetes can get complications, and they can be severe. So it's always on your mind. I'm sure it's on your mind. Absolutely. Yeah. What about you? Have you faced any of the uh, anything on the chart for you? Uh, I've been fairly lucky with just about everything. I'm in That's pretty good, good shape. That's I, great. Uh, you know, other than the cocaine habit, I think I'm doing <laughs> real well, Bonnie. It's just so hard to find drugs now. It is. It's it's well, insulin's a little more expensive than cocaine, so you know. It is. Yeah, it is. You know, interesting. Speaking of insulin <laughs> and its price, because yes. this one annoyed the it really shit out of me annoying. this morning. Do you know that in England they're paying half of what we're paying? For the same insulin. Would you explain that one to me? Uh, Oh, great. Oh, great. Brad, you diabetes hero squad person, you. It could be God's way of making up for all the fog they have to put up with. (laughs) I don't know what it is, but uh, hello, puppet. Give me a bottle of Imolo, will you? Um, Why it's cheaper in some places. You know, when Dr. Banting, the guy who discovered insulin, he discovered insulin and he gave away all rights to it. And he gave away rights to the, I think it was University of Toronto, to further diabetes education, research. And, you know, then it was taken over. I don't know. You know, there's a whole history of how it became. Now it's like $250 for a vial of insulin, you know, that you need to keep alive that may last a month. That's a lot of money. And for people that don't have it, especially in third world countries, you know, it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't mean that, oh, I'm in America, you know, I get it. Or if I'm in England, I get half a diabetes because the price is cheaper. <laughs> but when you have it, the price of insulin is way too high, it's just like most medications. And I'm sure if Donald Trump's elected, he'll lower the price of that. He doesn't know how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it better than anybody. I will make it cheaper. <laughs> I know that when I was first diagnosed, which was in 1968. Oh, my God. Um, insulin was two dollars and eighty three cents a bottle, and that wasn't my copay. We didn't know from copay that was the that. total amount. That was how much. Well, we let's paid. hop in the hot tub time machine and go back there, Don't Bonnie. You how think? about that? Yeah. A- and that sort of brings me to another issue, which is with all of the research being done now, and they're talking about cells being transplanted and implanted and re-implanted and then please they won't get killed off this all of these ideas are going to cost the patients hundreds of thousands of dollars so where do we get that money we aren't going to get it out of medicare no medicare won't cover the cost of a cgm and, you know, I believe, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but if they do find a cure, they're going to have to find a way to uh, make it so it isn't a one-time deal. In other words, you have to continue taking this medication or whatever forever. Unless they come up with this out of the United States. That's true. Okay, that's something that is pretty much an issue here. Because the work that's being done in Edmonton, the work that's being done in Tel Aviv, the work that's being done in Moscow, uh, unless Putin gets his hands on this one, too, um, they're not going to face that same thing. But we're stuck with what we have here, and what we have here is declining and declining and declining in, in, in terms of the ability to pay for the luxury of being a type 1 diabetic between my pump and my sensor. And I mean, I walk around with about 12 grand worth of stuff on me. You are a bionic woman, Bonnie. I am the bionic broad. The bionic broad, (laughs) well, if I said that, I'd get letters. I'll write you anyway. All right, Um, I have one more question that I want to ask you. Um, Do you have, it's two-sided. 
do you have any little special tricks in, now, 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 in terms of managing the diabetes? Oh, the diabetes. I, I, oh, the other tricks we'll talk about later. And um, also, what do you think the greatest challenge is to you personally? Well, I, you know, everybody develops their own tricks. You know what I mean? That's it's what because I since we're all like snowflakes, cold and uh, disappearing. Um, we all have to, we're different. Everybody's different. So I never really give advice to anybody else. My tricks usually are things that I found based on how my body reacts to everything. If I know a certain food is going to do something to me, I have to make adjustments, but it might not do it to you. So, you know, there's no one size fits all. And I think that's part of the problem with diabetes education because they have to hit a broad target. And Absolutely. by the time you get to your own particular needs, I, you know, we are our own doctors. We see, I see Absolutely. my endocrinologist and, and a bunch of other doctors, but I see them for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. I live with this every day, 24 seven. So my greatest challenge is just, you know, not irritating myself. I think that would be the best thing because, you know, if I don't do it right, then the other me, I am schizophrenic. You know that, don't you? <laughs> Both of you? Both of us are, aren't we? Shut up, leave them alone. <laughs> So I think it's, yeah, it is a matter of the tricks come with what you need to do to make Bonnie as controlled as she possibly can be. Well, Bonnie is not easily controlled I've heard in, in, <laughs> in terms of her diabetes or if you ask my ex-husbands in any way. How many? A few. A few. A few. A few. Yeah. A few. Not my best event. Anyway, <laughs> I also don't type, so now you know the worst about Bonnie. Right. Um what I'd like to do is have you take a listen with me to what I refer to as my blue world. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to go inside my blue world for a couple of headlines that are making news around the web and around the world. Do I need my passport? Or will I be considered an immigrant into your blue world? Oh, you, you got to pass oh, for okay. life. Well, you know, <laughs> type 1 diabetics are That's funny, right. they're bright, yeah. and my and some yeah. of my best friends are type 1. Oh, thank you. I don't know any. Uh, okay, just kidding. Um, so I would like for us to take a listen to this, and then I'd like to get your opinion, and we'll check on your thoughts. Hello, and welcome to the My T1 Group podcast, Inside My Blue World. I'm your host and type 1 diabetes crusader, Bonnie Shear. This is my weekly share, five headlines from around the globe and across the net with a focus on diabetes. You can find the links on my blog at bonniesheer.com. This week, the list starts and ends with headlines focused on technology and science, which may very well restore my faith in the Type 1 research community. The first headline share is great news from Medtronic, a medical technology company. New clinical trial brings artificial pancreas closer. Well, sign me up. According to the story on the company's diabetes blog, the hybrid uh, closed-loop clinical study is being conducted at diabetes centers in California, Colorado, Connecticut, and Israel. It will enroll up to 150 people aged 14 to 75 with type 1 diabetes on an insulin pump therapy. The hybrid closed-loop system is designed to automatically control glucose levels 24-7 with less human input. My second share is CMS releases new Medicare Part B reimbursement data. This comes from the Diabetes Patient Advocacy Coalition. 
CMS is short for Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The headline links to a summary of Physicians Medicare Part B reimbursements. By the numbers, nearly $90 billion in Medicare payments was paid out to over 950,000 health care providers across all 50 states, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico. If you are a long-term type 1 and a baby boomer like me, it's important to understand how these funds impact our care. My number three share, risk factors and symptoms of a diabetic coma, hits close to home considering I experienced one in my early 30s. The next headline share is from the Brand Institute at MIT and Harvard. Researchers find link between microbiome and type 1 diabetes. The findings of the study identified a connection between changes in the gut microbiota and the onset of type 1 diabetes. This connection holds the promise of improved diagnostic and therapeutic options. My last headline share for this week Getting Closer to a Cure for Type 1 Diabetes is from Diabetes Daily. The article reports on game-changing research, work that's been done by Professor Doug Melton and his team at Harvard University. This is my weekly share. For the link to these headlines and articles, please visit my blog at bonnieshare.com. Until we connect again, may your A1Cs be low and your resilience high. They loved it. Thank you. This is really, uh, that's some exciting stuff. We have a whole uh, studio full of people. Isn't this wonderful? And they are all dying to hear about Gut minutia. <laughs> 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 However, during that little break, um, Brad and I were just talking about this. Brad, you were mentioning that your doctor has discussed this with you. Can you give our audience and me a little background on what all this is? Well, I don't know so much specifically about it, other than when I go see her, she's a Cedar sinai Dr. Ruchi Mathur, one of the best endocrinologists I've ever had. And she was, that she was talking about some, I always, you know, when I go to a doctor, I don't always just go, well, this and then I don't just, you, you know, I kind of always say, how are you doing? Because it's part, of, I already know how I'm doing, and they'll tell me after I get the lab test about how I'm doing. But she talked about her research, and she mentioned the biodome. She was in um, a diabetes forecast, had an article about her and what she was doing with it. And it's interesting because she had mentioned that everybody's kind of doing their own little research thing on somebody's checking the, you know, the, uh, this sort of thing. Somebody else is doing the implant thing. Somebody else is doing uh, stem cells. And one of the things she mentioned, it made a lot of sense to me, maybe they all need to get together and start sharing the research to find out what is in common with everybody. So as far as me pontificating medically about what gut microbes are and, and, and uh, what was the word? Dia, uh, dipi, dipi, dipi. Sounded like a car I once had. <laughs> um, you can get that from, from looking at Bonnie's uh, articles. But it's important to know that it's good to have people out there looking at everything because you never know. It could be like, hey, we didn't know, but cucumber... Uh, Peelings uh, can uh, uh, help you. I don't know. You know, there are a lot of nutty people out there thinking that cinnamon does anything, and it doesn't, except it makes apple pie taste real good. <laughs> That's very true. Uh, just yesterday I got a text from somebody who's known me over 30 years telling me that a friend of hers um, cured her daughter of 
brain and heart and whatnot using oils and and that for diabetes i can throw away my insulin and be using pure peppermint and a couple other things and i texted her back and said well thank you for that information if i follow it i'll be dead this will be my last text to you it's still amazing to me that there is not a greater understanding. Oh, everybody has a story. My uncle drank three bottles of Johnny Walker a day, and he cured his diabetes. Yeah, well, no, he just forgot he had it. That's all. <laughs> the heck. Everybody Did, has advice. Didn't everybody, need those feet anymore anyway. And I have a unicorn in my garage. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Now, assuming, you know, I've... I've been waiting for a cure and hearing about this cure now. Five years away. Yeah, right. Uh, For 48 years. (laughs) And um, on my website, I have a counter, and it shows something absurd like 17,628 days waiting for this cure. Right. 17,000 fingers, or 68,000 finger sticks, 34,000 injections. This is a lifetime work. I don't know how type one save time to like get up and go to work. Right. It, it seems like from the first thing in the morning, check that uh, overnight. Did I rebound overnight? Where am I? It's something that we carry with us twenty four seven. There's there's just no vacation from it. No. Yeah. You know. But it's uh, you know again it's something that after you've had it for a few years you get used to dealing with it every day. But the, the I unfo- want to see your shrink. I don't deal nearly as well as you do apparently. Well, mine always shrinks when I get in cold water. Um, when you have it all day long, you have to you you know it's a matter of your body's going to do whatever it wants anyway. So you have to get used to that X factor. And what the X factor is, is always like, wait a minute, I just had that same lunch yesterday and it, it didn't screw me up. But I have it again today and it doesn't work. So it's the it's the ever present, you know, uh, not knowing what the heck's going on. That's I guess that's really what trips me up the most, yeah. because I like to plan everything. Are you very, an, you know, real life? Am I really anal? Is about, that what you were going to well, say? Well, you know, I said, were you angry about? No, I said, oh. yeah. <laughs> Are you anal about how you deal with things? It's like. Uh, especially being in show business, you can't control anything. So with diabetes, it almost kind of like I said, well, I know I can eat at this time and I want to do this and I'm going to go exercise. So you have that regulation in your life that you don't have in your career that you're able to control that. But then even with that, the diabetes is that X factor. And it keeps, us, it keeps life interesting. I'm very interested. It's going to keep me alive well, a long right. time. Well... Uh, Brad, thank you so much for coming in and sitting in with me today. And we would love to talk more and spend some more time with you. I'll be spending the night here, Bonnie. I found, <laughs> I found a parking spot on Gower. I'm not giving that up. I wouldn't either. I hate to end this segment, but it's time for me to step up on my soapbox. Well, please do. Okay. And so. First, I'd like to give a shout out to Bernie Sanders for taking a stand to expand Medicare. This made this boomer girl very happy to hear. And this from a man who led the call to let Hillary Clinton's email gate finally go. What a mensch. Now, for my shout down. Shame on you, Mike Huckabee, uh, for being a a paid spokesperson for the Diabetes Survival Kit, which claims to cure diabetes, claim type 2 diabetes. And yet, it turns out that there is not one medical agency that gives it any credence or any credibility or any support whatsoever. And this from the man who claims that the cure for cancer is in the Bible. Well, ladies and gentlemen, (laughs) that's our show for today. I'd like to thank my guests for being here with me. I would like to thank Suzanne Charney. I would like to thank Brad, the 
diabetes heroes. Meter Boy. Meter Boy. Did we show a picture of Meter Boy? Has anybody seen Meter Boy? No. That's why we switched to animation, because we look younger. We never age with the animation. <laughs> okay, guess what? Meter Boy is being shown now. Yeah, I look just like him, don't I? Oh, yeah, that's hot, baby. Fantastic Five. Can I join the heroes? You could. You're, you're an honorary Diabetes Hero Squad member. Oh, I love it. I love it. Ladies and gentlemen, again, I thank you for being with us today and with my guests. And until next time, to all of you Type 1s, may your A1Cs be low and your resilience high. And, you know, I like to think that there are speakers in heaven. And if there are, Sammy, this one's for you. Take us out, please. Whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong Whether I find a place in this world or never belong I gotta be me Can I be but what I am? I want to live, not merely survive. And I won't give up this dream of life that keeps me alive. I gotta be me. is waiting for me if I need the call I won't settle down won't settle for less as long as there's a chance that I can have it all I'll go it alone that's how it must be somebody else if I'm not right for me I gotta be free I've gotta be free daring to try to do it or die I've gotta be me I'll go it alone that's how it must be I can't be right for somebody else if I'm not right for me